fine. And then you can have a link to this talk later on. Will you yes. keep it? Yeah, on YouTube or something. Yes, yes, it will be okay. on YouTube. So I'll send okay. you the link after the after the lecture. Right. Okay. Okay, so we are live. Good okay. evening, everyone. Welcome to Carvan. If you're new to Carvan, do consider subscribing. Carvan, uh, the Heritage Exploration Initiative is an independent students-led initiative where we are trying to build a dialogue with the past, a bridge between scholarship and the public at large. You know, there's something coming here in front yeah, of me. Can, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can just click on that. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so welcome to Car Carvan, and this evening I have a very special guest, Professor Veena Talwar Aldenberg, who is a legend and uh, we all know about her scholarship. She was born and educated in Lucknow and still has her ancestral home there. And I got to know her ancestral home is also in Kanpur, where I belong and where, where I am currently. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree from Loreto Convent College and an MA from the University of Lucknow. She moved to the United States in the 70s and stayed on after her PhD in history to teach and share a life with Philip Waldenberg in New York. She is currently yeah. professor of history at Baruch uh, College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And she's the author of Davri Murder, The Imperial Origins of a Cultural Crime and the Making of Colonial Lucknow 1856 to 1877 and also Gurgaon from Mythic Village to the Millennium City. Today, Professor Aldenberg is going to talk about power and politics of reshaping the court city of Lucknow. If our audience have any question, they, they are requested to send their questions in the YouTube live chat. We'll be taking those questions post the lecture. So without further ado, thank you so much, Professor Aldenberg, for accepting our invitation for being here this evening, this morning for you, rather early morning. So over to yes. you and thank you so much once again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening, I should say, since you are mostly in India. Um, I'm very happy to come to talk to you, really not to lecture you. I'm, I'm not a lecturer. I'm a professor who have more, uh, you know, integrated style of talking where you could ask me questions and that furthers the talk. Uh, talk about a city that I was, you know, I'm a native of and I have grown up there. And finally, when I came away from it, when I came to America to study, to do my PhD, that's when I began to think about it more than ever before, more than when I lived there. Because when I lived there, you know, you live in, a, in an environment, you're going to school, you're doing your schoolwork. There's no sense of the wholeness of the city. And as a history student, I really became very serious when I was doing my MA and then finally my PhD. And the city just was a topic which hadn't been written on. The Nawabi, yes, you talked about the Nawabs, you talked about the culture, but how the city grew and how it changed and how it is reshaped with the changing power structure. That became something which has been a continuing interest of mine. Even today, I'm very interested on how, for example, Mayavati attaches a whole new part of the city on the other side of the banks of the Gomti, where a city never existed before. She's done a very, uh, I think, a fairly elegant job, even though a park should have more greenery and less stone, but be that as it may, the stonework is very skilled, very good sculpture, and has really has added to the interest of very important structures in the city, which I will be talking about. It certainly is the last phase, but we will to up to this day, so we will go through that. City of Lucknow has a very humble beginning. It was just a 
grain market, a mandi or a ganj, on the banks of the Gomti, because it was connected by waterways. You know, all the grain moved on waterways because that was the quickest way of getting heavy loads from the harvest. This is the heart of the Indo-Gangetic plain, uh, possibly, arguably, the most fertile place on earth. Uh, I know, I grew up uh, there and I know what, how lush and green and brilliant it used to be. And so this grain market, and it had a little hillock. And in mythology, we say that this is Lakshman Tila or the Tila where, you know, when Ram was in Ayodhya, he put Lakshman here. And it's very amazing to see that in Ayodhya, five miles from it, grew up the city of Faizabad, which was the first uh, capital of the Nawabs of Awad, who were to build Lucknow later. They first built it in Faizabad. The re Faizabad is far east, about 90 miles east of Lucknow. And the reason for starting the city there is that it was closer to Calcutta, to other, you know, Calcutta was already from 1660, had been built. A lot of trade had moved to the East India Company. So it was seen to be more uh, appropriate to have it more on the Eastern flank. It was not until, so Faisabad grew into a nuclear capital, meaning in a small nucleus form with the palace, with a tomb, with an Imam Bara and so on, which was to be replicated in building Lucknow as the new capital. That happened in 1775 with the young Nawab, very young, about 26 years old, when he came with his nobility, moved from Faizabad to Lucknow. The move was partly strategic, partly domestic. Some people say, oh, he didn't like the Bahu Begum. His mother was quarreling. And she was actually a very fine ruler. And she wanted control of the court. And he didn't quite like that because he was pleasure loving. He had friends who liked dance and music and drinking and so on, that he moved just to avoid that. That move was really foundational for shaping Nawabi Lucknow. He came there and as all, you know, all old medieval cities were, what you do is you build a build a religious site. So his Asafi Mambara, Asafi Mosque are still centerpieces of what remains of Nawabi Lucknow. Uh, the Rumi Gate was to be built later on by uh, Ghaziuddin Haider, but this all begins to happen in the last quarter of the 18th century when Asaf Adola was reigning. Can we show you a picture of him? So you can see what a grand noble he is. Please look at him. If you see his a picture of his grandfather, which I didn't put in, Baram, uh, you know, Baram Khan, and then Saftar Jung, his, uh, his grandfather, they are in very coarse clothes. They didn't have this jewelry. They didn't even have a regal appearance. In fact, the first Nawab, uh, who came from, you know, Central Asia, he had, uh, the, or Persia, he had a fur hat, which you might see on the head of a Russian. Uh, and then you find that the next fellow is wearing, next, the grandfather's wearing a cloth wrap, you know, a, a safa. But now the safa is encrusted with jewels and he is wearing not pigeon size, uh, pigeon egg size raf sapphires, but if you look at them, they're hen's egg sized and they're cornflower blue, the purest, the most valued sapphires in the world. And he's just wearing them for his portrait. You can see that the ring he's wearing is also sapphire. Sapphire has always been considered the mark of royalty and most kings all over the world prefer sapphires to even diamonds. 
And uh, so that is a very valued thing. And you can see that he has now the wealth of Avad in his control, and he can start building quite lavishly. And it was, it's reputed that there was a, you know, there were a few years of famine, bad crops, and Asif Udola built his largest buildings to give employment to a lot of very distressed people who had moved to Lucknow. And it's also said that the nobility also took up manual labor and they worked at night to build these very big monuments. Can we move that uh, picture? Now Asaf Adawla has a flourishing court and for the next 80 years, you find that the fabric of the city grows under Nawabi, um, uh, under it, the reign of the Nawabs. And you have people like Ghaziuddin Haider who build the Shah Najaf Imambara, which is to this day very, you know, very well uh, kept up, extremely or ornamented with Belgian chandeliers and so on. But the very fact that there are Belgian chandeliers shows that there's been some other kind of movement into the city. That is that the East India Company has been, as you know, spreading like an ink stain on the map of India, just turning everything pink, which is what the imperial color was. And Lucknow and Avad are definitely in their crosshairs. They want it. It is one of the richest parts of South Asia and they want it for the revenue. But they can't take it because parliament has forbidden any further wars of conquest. After the two Sikh wars, the last, the second one in 1849, when they took over the Punjab, that was the last acquisition through conquest. It was such a bloody war and such an unnecessary war because the Sikhs were really quite, you know, uh, prosperous, they were well governed. Ranjit, Maharaja Ranjit Singh was one of the finest rulers that ever took a throne in South Asia. And he's been compared to, you know, not just to Akbar, but to the best European rulers and built tremendously uh, beautiful city of Lahore, which had only got a uh, few, you know, uh, religious monuments, which Jahangir had built. So why, why go after the Sikhs? Well, the Punjab, as you know, was the breadbasket of uh, the whole of South Asia and um, therefore very, you know, greed looks for money. And that was rich. So after that, they could not conquer. So what they do is they've already made a theory. Uh, they were very good at immediately, you know, you make a law and then you make a loophole. And that's how authority works. You immediately create the loophole for yourself, the law for the people. So if they can't take by conquest, they could take by their doctrine of lapse, which all of you who have studied Indian history must know about. But just to remind you, a kingdom would lapse to the East India Company for one of two reasons. One, if there was no male heir to the current ruler. And you know about Jhansi Kirani, she was supposed not to have her own child. The child was declared illegitimate, all that politics went on and they took over much of Madhya Pradesh. So on, on those grounds, even though she was to fight in the mutiny to save her, the Ghadar of 1857, um, which they considered only a mutiny, it was a much widespread thing and she took part in it, but that's how it lapsed. Now they're looking at Avad and they can't find a reason to uh, 
The second reason was that the ruler, even if he had male heirs and succession was, you know, completely legitimate, you, the ruler could be declared as dissolute, a bad manager, in one word, a debauch. They use this word a lot. And one of my works in progress, which I haven't been able to do because of my bad eyes, is the making of the Oriental debauch. They created this category that they would go in, examine the ways of life of rulers of provinces they still wanted and declare them as debauches. So how did this happen? How did this function? Well, a resident is in place. He in Lucknow gets, you know, the Nawab himself has to give him a big palace with huge grounds called the residency. It, it was another manzil, but it was it became the residency. It was almost purpose built for English usage. And they had a very stunning palace in there with billiard room and dining rooms with huge, you know, huge uh, teak tables and amazing. None of that has survived, of course, because of the weather. But uh, it is a very picturesque ruin and still one of the chief attractions for visiting uh, Lucknow. So uh, the residency develops on the bank of the river on which the English formerly had no presence. They still had to keep their cantonment. They wanted to bring troops. They were asked to keep them on the other side of the river, which was connected already by an iron bridge and a stone bridge. The two bridges are still in existence in Lucknow, if you visit it, and you can see them. They are very fine works of, of uh, architecture and of engineering at, at that early stage in history uh, built by the Nawabs. So you find that the cantonment is on the other side. Now they have kept spies all over, they have, uh, you know, they can't really make a case against Wajid Ali Shah, who's the last Nawab, who comes in, into power in uh, 1837, and he is going to rule till 1857 or 56. So he has only those nine years in which he does incredible extension of uh, palaces, you know, the Chatar Manzils, uh, I mean, the Chatar Manzils was older, but there are lots of palaces. And of course, there is the Kaisar Bagh and so on. Uh, Husseinabad, Imam Bara and the clock tower, which are very, also very famous sites, are already near the, uh, the big Imam Bara and that formed the cluster of the royal part of Nawabi city. So now we have uh, Wajid Ali making the city beautiful with lots of monuments and gardens. And of course, a cuisine has come to flourish, music, dance. Lucknow has really become a cultural ca capital, a microcosm of the finest urban culture that you can find in South Asia. And that, to that we owe uh, Persia a great debt because a lot of it was Persianized, but there's also a huge amount of influence of the Oswal Jains, you know, the jewelers to the Nawab, the, the Kayasts who kept the books and were, you know, were very often the, the top ranking treasury officers under the Nawabi. And of course, the Brahmins who also made a sort of a pact with the Shias and kept them, you know, the, a lot of the Hindus and Muslims kept this empire going. But now comes Wajid Ali Shah is being tormented. His revenues have been reduced, taken over by the resident. 
even though people are migrating to Awadh from parts of British India, uh, because their, their taxation is very high and their treatment of those who lapse is to take away their lands and so on, that a lot of people are voting with their feet and coming to Awadh. This also is a great shame and annoyance for the British, so they want immediately to take over Awadh. So what they do is they make a blue book. This is a list of charges of all kinds of debauchery. The Parikhana is seen as a whorehouse, all sorts of stuff, which is historically proven to be utterly and totally wrong. They make up this charge sheet, call it the parliamentary blue book, and say, because you are so debauched, your kingdom will lapse to the East India Company. This is in 1856. And they present him with a treaty. A treaty, as you know, is only among equals. You can't have a treaty with a, someone you can depose. But contradictions in colonialism are many, and we have good literature on all that. So the Nawab refuses to sign the treaty. And he decides that Queen Victoria, who has said that, you know, we will not take over anything that was a parliamentary thing. How can you take this over? So he starts his journey in 1856 to go to Calcutta to board a, board a ship to go all the way to England to present his case. However, 40,000 people join him in leaving Lucknow. This is a great loss to the art, culture, cuisine, etc., because he picks the best people in all these fields to travel with him. Once he gets to Calcutta, he's of course exiled and he is uh, immediately you know, arrested and then put under house arrest in a suburb of, uh, it's very malarial, you know, the whole of Calcutta at this point is a very sickly place because of the, the way the waters, the Hooghly and whatnot, you know, it's a, it's a malarial swamp. So he's, he says, I'll get sick here, I'm not used to this kind of thing. So they put him in Matya Burj, which is a sort of a suburban village of um, Calcutta, where he builds a new capital. He's given the sum of one lakh a month from the very, very huge revenues of, um, of uh, Abad as expenses because his court has moved with him and they can't really uh, strip him of all authority. He's been stripped of authority, but not of a lifestyle. So he rebuilds that in Matya Burj while Lucknow is now up in arms. And this is the trauma of which I have written a great deal. The, my book is really deals with this moment in history. 1857, the whole of our, it begins in a cantonment. That's why the name mutiny is there. It's not a, you know, they see it as an uprising in their own cantonment and therefore call it a mutiny. And this mutiny occurs, starts in Meerut, and then it spreads. And it soon becomes an outright rebellion and hatred for the British takeover of Awadh. And it goes beyond that. It goes to Murshidabad. It, it really stretches all the way east and west. And it is a, the largest resistance to British um, uh, rule in the history of the British Empire. Nothing so large had ever happened. In fact, they came within the skin of their teeth to losing their Indian Empire because the siege in Lucknow was the longest that ever happened in a part that they had conquered. Now, uh, there, there, you know, my husband, who's American and also Indian political scientist, he said, hey, wait a minute, you can't call it the longest. What about the American Revolution? 
that lasted for three years or whatever. This only lasted 14 months. And my argument for that is that the revolution in America is not really a revolution. It's the English against the English. And just because some people now want to throw out their incompetent monarchs like George III, who's certifiably mad, and William IV, who was a total debauch. My word, that's the paper that I have to still write if I can. And they um, don't throw them out, but they throw out Vajid Ali. And you find that that rebellion is really very, very uh, deep. However, Lucknow becomes a battlefield because the greatest resistance of the rebels, they, they come from various parts of Avad and they want to take over because the resident is there and the cantonment. They set fire to the cantonment, which is across the river, remember? And they also lay siege to the compound of the residency. All the English, and there's something like almost 3,000 of them, because the troops are, you know, at least 2,500 troops, British troops, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, and English, all are now compacted within the, uh, the residence. This leads to some of the fiercest bombardment a city has ever seen before World War I. Um, three, Three fifths of the fabric, the existing houses, homes, palaces, mosques, temples, Jain temples, gurdwaras, whatever existed in Lucknow was demolished. About two fifths remain, and around the residency and the royal part of the city, which which had the you know the Chhatar Manzils and uh, Kaisar Bagh and so on. They build an espionage, and this is the reshaping, really. This is the total reshaping. They make an esplanade, meaning an empty area, 500 yards in diameter. Now, for a city that was very compact at that time, 500 yards, you cut it all around on this bank of the Gomti, is going to destroy uh, all the best neighborhoods where the elite uh, of Lucknow lived. And the chalk is left because it just comes after the 500. If you measure it from, from uh, you know, uh, the residence, you will see that it just misses the mark. Otherwise, Chalk Bazaar would also have been destroyed, but that was saved and the Akbari gate was saved, but much of the other parts were destroyed. And the largest buildings were taken over and converted into uh, government offices. Chhatar Manzil, where Vajid Ali Shah um, often lived when he was not in the Kaisar Bagh palace. That was, uh, that became, you know, first a government office. And today, as you know, it's the central drug research Institute, and even while it's not in very good shape, not maintained very well, it still is the shift that the colonialism made. So this is how power reshapes. Why did they bombard the city? Why did they open up big roads? Through the Esplanade and beyond, they opened up seven radial roads, which exist in Lucknow today. True, they are cluttered and so on. We'll talk about that in a minute. But these seven radial roads were built chiefly for military purposes. What had happened during the Ghadar, they could not defeat the rebels quickly because there were these little lanes and alleyways and they could hide in the courtyards of the houses of the elite and get shelter. And so they just said, the city is dangerous, the city has to be safe. And in fact, the chapter in my book, which describes this in enormous detail is 
how the city was made safe. The next thing is, of course, to build the cantonment, which had been destroyed. And they realized that we don't build it across the river. That was dangerous. We build it in the city and we build our civil lines, which is where the police, the bureaucracy, and the other wealthy people who were school teachers and you know people who came from England to, to service the empire would live. And so the whole civil area is attached to the contournement or contiguous to it. And that becomes really the cookie cutter. I, I think of it as the cookie cutter of the colonial city. What do you need to run a city if you are an external power? You need your contournement, you need your police lines, you need your own palaces and so on. And they adopted, as they did in Calcutta, the bungalow style, that there would be only single storied homes with large gardens around them, a, a, a small wall so they could see. And the, the, the offset you know, from the wall to the house would be very long so that any guard could see from the top. You know, the top had parapets and the chokidars or the guards would sit up there with guns. And if anyone jumped over the wall and came, they could be shot. They didn't want high walls because then you could not see the street. You could not really control the area. So you can see the bungalows. There are still some remaining. A lot of the bungalows have been torn down and you know our population has created a density which did not exist in the civil lines at least, and so on. The other thing to make a city safe and to make it loyal to the new ruler is to bring in a new elite. The Nawabi is gone. They were Shias. They were, you know, Islam has Shia and Sunni. The Shia uh, rule is over now. The Persianate Shia rule is gone. And they now want to get a new elite into the city. And they find their loyalties among the talukdars. Now they do a very important change in the status of the talukdars. The taluka was actually composed of many villages, up to 500 villages. The biggest uh, talukas had five or even a thousand villages. So there were, Talukas of vary, varying sizes, and the talukdar was the tax collector for the nawabs. And actually, it was a Mughal uh, idea, so it was all the way up to the Mughals. And you have talukdars or zamindars, as they were called in Bengal and Bihar, and so on. Talukdar is especially uh, used in, in Avad, the word. But it's the same meaning as the zamindar. The zamindars were also tax collectors. But what the British do is they introduce the idea of private property, titles to property. A single and determinate owner was the chief idea that the British brought to landed property in India. The talukdars were just tax collectors. They had a lot of authority. They even had soldiers who helped them collect taxes with people who refused to pay or something. There was some, you know, some force, some violence was used, etc. But they never owned the land. Ownership means you can buy, sell, subdivide, etc. The zamindars could never do this, nor could the talukdars. Now, with ownership, the lords of the land have become landlords. And what they can do is really quite harmful because supposing there's a bad season. Bad season means people can't, you know, all the money is coming really from agriculture because of the richness of the land. The farmers can't pay their revenue because they didn't have a good crop. The British say, if you don't pay, on a certain, they make two dates on which uh, the jama, the revenue, 
had to be deposited, not as formally, which was collected from them. They didn't have to go anywhere. It was the, you know, the Talukdar's men came and they took it from you in grain. They didn't ask for money. There was no, the monetary system was not that big that everyone had cash lying around. So it was a, it was given in kind in grain or in any other produce or in cows or, you know, various ways of compensating the government for its share. Now, however, the British put in three or four very strict rules. One, a fixed date. End of March, end of September. These were the, you know, the Kharif and the Rabi, that's how you're going to pay. The two crops, the two major crops. Uh, actually, India has two and a half major crops, but the middle crop in the summer was not so, you know, they had to pay their taxes just twice a year. Then they also said, monetize. We are going to expect it in cash. We have no go-downs to keep your, your grain, and we a lot of it is lost in transit and this, that, and the other. Uh, we need cash, gold, silver. So these mints are set up, as you know, and there's a lot of minting of uh, now, you know, the old coins are taken and even those are melted down and new coins are made with Queen Victoria on them. And if you look at my the cover of my book called The Making of Colonial Lucknow in its original form, which is Princeton University Press, you'll see the two coins. You'll see Victoria's coin taking over the Nawabi coin. And the third is that the Jama itself, the money you owe was based on an average of 10 years revenue from the record books of the Nawab. And you were given a fixed average amount to pay every year. And that was your due. Now, you know, <laughs> crops don't behave in an average way. They're sometimes very good, sometimes very bad, sometimes middling. So you can't pay a fixed rent. You know, it's like saying to you, your income for the past 10 years has been X. And this is the average of the last 10 years. You began your job and then you end your job. So we are going to fix your income for the rest of your life. No matter how much you, more you make or less, you will pay this for the rest of your life. Well, when you retire, what do you do? Or when you grow old or you get sick one year and you couldn't work at all, how do you pay that tax? Well, now that you had a title, a piece of paper, which declared you to be the determinate owner, they could take you to the auction. And believe me, in the Punjab, where I've done extensive work, in the first four years of taking, they, they brought this system into every part that they ruled and even to Rajasthan where they didn't rule, where there was, you know, the Rajasthan Maharajas were still ruling, but they forced them to accept this through their residency systems. That this is very primitive. You don't have any owner. You have, you know, all these people with shares in the crop. We can't handle that. We want a simple figure to be paid to us in cash on a particular date. That is the hallmark of the change that colonialism brought and therefore changes the very mood of the people. This is supposed to be a sort of a modern move. You know, we're moving you out of the barter system into a monetized economy. And you can see how that has become not just uh, then, but remains today and in the world, property has become a private matter and it is bought and sold. It is inherited. The Talukdars used to lose, you know, if Talukdar wasn't good or he was too tyrannical, well, he lost his Taluka and someone else was appointed. Now these are permanent fixed property rights and they are brought into the city not just as talukdars, they're given all kinds of titles. Maharaja, Ra, you know, there were three Maharajas. Maharaja Kapoorthala, not only Maharaja in Punjab, but also in Abad, Balrampur, and 
The third one always escapes me, but it's in my book if you should care to read it. There were also Raja Sahabs. This was a new title created for the Talukdars. And so you get Raja Sahab Balrampur, Raja Sahab, I mean, Raja Sahab, you know, Mahmudabad, Jangirabad, all kinds of Rajas. And they're given a varied number of gun salutes. So every time a Raja enters the city, the guns go off. You can imagine that pollution was being caused even then, but the skies were very clear. There were no motor cars yet. So things were still breathable. Uh, so gun salutes and these talukdars are encouraged to come into the city and build their palaces. And if you, uh, any of you who are familiar with Lucknow will know that Katesar, Tiva, Jangirabad, um, Katesar, uh, Kat oh, they're, they're about Pirpur house and, uh, you know, all kinds of houses crop up. Um, Kotra house, uh, these have, some of these have been torn down and high rises have come up in their place, but these became the most notable residences around the core of the city. Hazrat Gan, which was an old market is refurbished, built it a more rebuilt parts of it to make it into a very grand um, European market in the way that they were um, in other parts of Europe with, you know, very uh, shops, uh, tailoring and um, all kinds of consumer goods and so on. Because Lucknow was to embrace modern consumerism of that time, but not modernity. And this is an important distinction, which will keep some of Lucknow's uh, culture alive, because the Talukdars realize that to be accepted by the people of Lucknow, they have to um, be patrons of the cuisine. They can't just turn to rice doll and cutlets men. They have to become people who will um, keep the Bavarchi Khanas going, keep uh, the jewelers going, uh, dress now in fine brocades and, you know, wear Indian dress. They don't shift to suits till really the 20th century. They still wear very nice angarkas and brocade achkans and so on, which are Persianate in the, because India didn't have any tailoring or anything like that. Uh, but today, all the rulers mark their, their persona by the tailored achkan or the tailored waistcoat or the tailored kurta or the tailored pajama. And not many rulers run around in dhotis and shawls and, you know, the unstitched garments of the past. So, uh, so you have now a city which is coming up really for the safe control of colonial power. Uh, with what with the, I described the contournement. Something else happens, and this is going to take me uh, to the courtesans of Lucknow, which I have also done some research on and written on. They were, the the gatekeepers of the culture of Lakshya. They were women, I mean, they are extraordinary women because in that time, women didn't receive um, education, formal education. These are the only educated women in town, in, in Lucknow. Even the Maharaja's wives, you know, they're really not uh, they don't read and write. They put their thumbprint if they have to make some, you know, some sign, some document. They are, their fingers are inked and they place their thumbprint. And that's how they are recognized. You see with photography, the British wanted to absolutely capture every single person in authority, native author natives, you know, like the talukdars and the landowners, all the new landowners that have been created now to be photographed and be put into an album so that they would know 
who the owner is, and then they would create a new album for a certain family when the next generation takes over. In this, the only women that are ready to be photographed are uh, the, the wives, the courtesans. They are very happy to show their beautiful jewelry, their gorgeous faces, their lavish living styles. They, they search, you know, um, the Roga Abbas Ali is the great photographer. He goes around, he can't get any women's faces. He's employed by the British, but he does get, he makes this album, which is famous in photographs of that time called The Beauties of Lucknow. But a huge change comes into the courtesan culture that had kept up cuisine, fashions, uh, jewelry, design, um, all, you know, even lifestyle, the sort of silver hookahs and uh, uh, fly whisks made of jade handles. I mean, they, they had the money. Uh, I, when I was doing my research, I came across the tax ledgers of 1862, which had not been opened since perhaps, you know, the 1870s or 80s. When uh, 1877, the capital moves from Lucknow, the Avad capital, from Lucknow to Allahabad. They don't go to Faisabad, they go to Allahabad because it is better connected by two rivers, the Yamna and the Ganga, for their movement of grain and troops. So Allahabad uh, becomes the capital. But in, in Lucknow, after the mutiny, after what they call the mutiny, because they're doing a reckoning of the mutiny, what did it cost us? Even though they won in the end, uh, they, you know, it was really a firic. They lost a lot of people. A lot of Europeans died in that mutiny. And they wanted to know the causes. Why did people die? And they discover that a quarter of the deaths of the soldiers, the real combatants, in the, who were defending the residency and so on, died of disease and not in combat. And a quarter of those who died in, of disease died of venereal disease. Venereal disease, they said, my word, how did this happen? Well, the main venereal disease, of course, at that time was syphilis and another was gonorrhea. Both these diseases came from the new world through the soldiery. You know, it's like, who's, uh, you know, where does COVID come from? And everybody gets it, but it comes out of China. So syphilis and gonorrhea were coming out of South, what is today South America and North America. And this was transported through British soldiery to India. And it spread among the soldiers. So the British were not going to confess that there's any homosexuality in their ranks. That would be a complete no-no in Victorian times. Um, it was punishable by law, punishable by death, punishable by you know every kind of barbaric means to stop this. So they couldn't say how this was spreading. So the obvious culprits they thought are the tawives, these notch ghars, notch, notch, as they said, these notch khanas and these uh, kothas are the source of this. But frankly, they were not. The, the notch khanas got it from the soldiers when they were allowed to come in. They weren't allowed during the Nawabi. And you don't have this problem. But straight after that, you know, gonorrhea and syphilis can spread in minutes, as you can imagine, since it's sexually transmitted. And you find that some, some do have, um, here they are, here are my tawives. And in fact, these are perhaps the ones that I've written on. Yes, I, 
recognize them, but you can see their, their gorgeous gararas and shararas and, uh, you know, they're very heavy brocade. The jewelry is astonishing and so on. So there they are. And I would like to um, show you all, well, we'll come to that after I finished with the courtesans. Now the courtesans, how do they deal with this problem? Firstly, they declare them as rebels. Now these are patently non-combatants. I mean, can anyone go to war dressed like this and fight a siege? No. What they did do, however, was keep the rebels in their homes, in their quotas, in their very extensive properties they owned. Uh, when I, I was telling you about the court uh, the tax records, when I saw the 1862 tax records, the highest income bracket was called dancing girls, dancers, singers, and boon companions. But the chief ones, and they were listed by name, and that was a great document to find because then I could know what their names were and find out what their properties were. They owned orchards, they owned palaces, they owned a lot of ca uh, cattle, you know, cows and goats and sheep and all, all that. And they had the equal of ba Bavarchi Khanas, which you can think of as, um, as maybe the modern restaurant where food was cooked and transported for weddings and for major funerals and major, you know, major events, uh, ceremonial or funereal. And these were very often owned by the Tawaif Gharanas. So now what happens is they've been declared as combatants, their properties are seized, they are called rebels, and any rebel could not hold property in the eyes of the British. They had betrayed the Raj because in 1858, the Raj, meaning the crown takes over, meaning Queen Victoria takes over. It's no longer the East India Company, which is disbanded in 1858 after the end of the siege. And so suddenly from the trading communities and this, you get the Raj, you get a, a bureaucracy, which was called the Indian Civil Service, which is created actually during the East India Company itself, but now it is really uh, has much more authority because it represents the crown in the parts that they are posted. So a new wave of building has to begin in Lucknow because the old buildings have been shattered. And I told you, firstly, the, you know, the civil lines and the cantonment and so on. But you also start getting expansions of the city because of, say, the, the cantonment. You know, it was, what, 300 or 400 acres uh, in all. And those were hundreds of villages. Now these people have to be moved somewhere or given some housing. So you get a very, uh, you know, the kind of uh, architecture which marks the Raj, not the Indo-Saracenic, Latians, Delhi, you know, the, the capital of Delhi, the way it was built by the British in red sandstone. These are really what we would call quarters single room, single cell, put in the family, and you get this very, um, not very aesthetically pleasing brick, what I would call ovens, because they are single brick with hardly any insulation, like the mud huts would have had, or any other kind of building, you know, with the angan and the verandas, there was always circulation. Now they are just built in rows and, they dot the landscape of almost any city in which the colonials had to move in. I should have said at the outset that the colonials have uh, other cities to their, um, 
to their name. And the, you know, the earliest cities built were the port cities, Madras, Calcutta, and Bombay in that order. And they had forts as the principal place to keep them safe. And the city was contained within the fort and outside the fort was what they called black town. Black town because they saw us as black uh, in Madras, in Calcutta, in, in Bombay. The natives were colored or black and the fort contained where they lived. And then they, later on, as they expanded, the East India Company expanded, they started to build cantonments. In fact, um, at the top, at the peak of the Raj, there were 110 built cantonments in India. And now I believe there are a few more, but not that many. And all those cantonments have been maintained exactly as inherited by the British authorities. There. And you find that, you know, the officers now occupy the places where the Europeans lived and the soldiers use the barracks where the Tommies lived. Okay, so we, we now come to this change with Talukdars coming in, they becoming, you know, the Talukdars, it has to be pointed out, during the Nawabi were not allowed because they were sort of employed by the Nawabi as tax collectors. They didn't have the status of anyone. So they were not allowed to come into the city riding a horse. They could visit, but they had to get off at the entrance points of the city, walk on foot. They could not wear silk because that was a mark of royalty. So they had to wear sooth, you know, sooty uh, cotton clothes and uh, they could not wear tush, the, the pashmina and the shahtush. They could, they could afford those things, but they could not wear them, not when they came to see the Nawab. They could wear them maybe in their own talukas. And now you find that the talukdars are replacing uh, the cultural icons of the city. They become the patrons of, you know, they have mujras, they have uh, cuisine. If you go to a um, Talukdar's house or even to a, you know, uh, now that we have a big, big, big middle class, if you go to their houses and you want to eat in Lucknow, you still will get a biryani, kebab, if it's, if it's non-vegetarian. Of course, if you go to a banya home or, a, you know, the, Jain home, you will get excellent vegetarian food, which is also very hallmarked by Lucknow. Puri, alu, kaddu, um, you know, loki, and so on. And a particular dal, which is arar ki dal with a zire ka tarka, which is very well known, uh, you know, cumin uh, tempering, which is known in, in Lucknow to be one of the favorite dishes of the vegetarian communities of Lucknow. So you find that the city has moved, uh, you know, uh, very much towards where the civil lines are and the new areas are going to come up. And it is due to that huge trauma, which we call the Ghadar of 1857. But another and yet, you know, this is like a palimpsest where the Nawabi half erased, a new city comes up, and then you get another thing, you get the partition of 1847. This is not in my book, however, but I have kept up. I, you know, belong to Lucknow and I've been going there every year. The first year I didn't come to Lucknow is this particular year, which is 2021 because of COVID and so on, and other circumstances which have changed in my life that I, I could not go this year. But every other year in my life, I have visited or lived in Lucknow. Uh, well, the newest trauma, and may I bring the British, uh, the picture of the British statuary? They had ornamented this, 
this was new. The Nawabs never had any statuary because they do not believe. Here we are. The builders of colonial Lucknow, Harcourt, uh, well, you have uh, Canning, you know, Canning is over there. This is Harcourt Butler on equestrian statue, waving his trilby to the people. Oh, sorry, this is Clemency Canning, Canning and this is some other, maybe one of the major uh, bureaucrats who, you know, get uh, names who played major roles in the um, mutiny to defend their residency. This is Edward the Seventh, the king himself, in his multiple robes and this and that, and now jewels. Much of them, I would like to tell you, are from Lucknow itself, stolen from the Kaiserbag. They removed twenty-six barrels of jewelry from one palace alone, the Kaiserbag Palace and apartments. There were about eighty apartments there, which were occupied by the many Begumate Avad of Wajid Ali Shah. He had four um, Nikahi wives, meaning actual wives which are permitted in general Islam. But he also had what the Shia community has, uh, the ability to have Mutahi wives, meaning the muta is done as a temporary measure. You can have a muta for 10 years, five years, two years, one year, and even down to days, so that the woman you sleep with, you never commit adultery because you are, you are in a temporary uh, marriage with her. So that's where they lived. The Begavate Avad lived in Kaiserbagh, uh, Wajid Ali Shah's, and they had the most exquisite jewelry, 26 barrels of their jewelry and their you know, silver hookahs and gold hookahs and pandans made of, you know, amazing things. This was all melted down and made into coin uh, in a lot of the stuff that they didn't know what to do with, such as a pandan, probably just melted it and made it into British uh, coinage. But here you have this. Uh, but why are they all together? Why are they not on pedestals? Because in 1947, the rule changed. And let's go to the police lines now and see them. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, there's another uh, photo which shows them all on the pedestal they are standing. And I was hoping, well, I don't know. Oh, here they are. Uh, this is the current police lines in Lucknow. And our friend who's uh, chief of police at that point in Lucknow, he took us there, he sent us there and he said, please, um, uh, she's a researcher and she wants to come and look at the police line. I never knew I would encounter this. These were statues that ornamented Lucknow during the colonial period. We never saw them, those of us who were not born yet, to, to be able to uh, see them in situ. But I will take you to the places where they were removed from and who replaced them because power changes. And now in these days, so does the statuary. As you know, uh, Mayavati has made statuary again, a very important idea. And uh, she has several of those in the part of the city that she built, but I'm coming to that. Let's now move on to the next one, please. This is where Harcourt Butler was on a marble platform. This is the corner of Hazrat Ganj. And now Ambedkar, the writer of our constitution and one of the great leading lights intellectuals. He has a PhD from Columbia University, where of course I'm sitting in New York. Uh, he is now the icon of the city and it, it is in fact very, um, very timely, very because you did have Mayavati and Akhileshwar um, and so on come in, Mulayam Singh and 
uh, come in who represent a, a minority who never were allowed to have statues made to them or even enter our homes in a way we you know in india uh, among the hindus there's this disgusting habit of the caste system which is getting stronger and deeper and more ridiculous and ambedkar was a liberator if he had become let's say the prime minister we might have had even a bigger liberation of who we today call dalits and that is very needed and till that happens we are never going to be a country that will be respected except for you know it's like slavery is gone but there's a lot of discrimination the caste system was written out of the constitution but it still as you all know exists fiercely and disgustingly everywhere in india today can we move to the next one please and this of course who doesn't know this figure dhoti clad with his walking stick and this is where edward the 7th stood and this remained empty for the longest time as i was growing up this uh, statue was not there because they could not decide how to make a statue big enough gandhi big enough that would be proportional to the canopy that he was going to occupy and this canopy he's very diminutive you can see these people are you know 5 feet 6 5 feet 7 and he is even smaller and he's really his own height it's a it's a true living image that has been made it's a very beautiful place and the plinth is high enough that if you go up here you can reach because this is a 6 foot plinth with your arm up you can touch his feet and not many are even capable not capable but uh, justified in touching his feet because their politics are very heinous and i will not say anything further than that but do look at the clock tower there is a husainabad clock tower built by the nawabs and the machinery brought in by the frenchman who and the frenchman and the englishman who had come in or already during the nawabi when the french lost and you know claude martin is one of them who built the great constantia palace for himself which became his tomb to preserve it and here is the british clock tower with an art deco face and it still tells the accurate time for those who pass it in hazrat ganj what is that okay i don't know so um that said we now move to what mayavati has done and while i have not written about it i have gone and looked at it it's a brand new area it is uh, taken up some of the most fertile areas of the banks of the gomti where gomti nagar indra nagar um, the whole of you know the new colonies have been built and the new middle class has taken over that area as their own turf uh, mayavati however built the great park which um, you know people have accused her of being grandiose but why not why can't a dalit be as grandiose as let's say any colonial ruler or any nawabi ruler or any you know i mean modi is redoing the central vista um what's what's the need for that but you know rulers have to express themselves somehow in tinkering with the city fabric the city is where they live they don't live in their villages anymore they live in the cities and they have to put a mark a hallmark on that city and mayavati's hallmark actually is a very elegant one and i'm rather um impressed by the aesthetic in that 
park, except that I wish there was more greenery because the stone gets very hot. And even in, I went there in, you know, January, December, those were the months I used to be in Lucknow. And even in uh, winter sun can heat up the stones uh, to make them unpleasant for those who visit. And of course, it has a rather formidable um, railing around it and gates and so on, so that it's not really the kind of public space that you find the residency has become today, which is looked after by the British, um, what do you call them, the British Embassy, uh, the High Commission pays for the maintenance of the uh, residency today because it was made into a graveyard. There are lots of uh, English people buried there. Henry Lawrence, who was a great uh, hero, um, and also built, you know, the Lawrence School, Sanar, and so on and so forth, uh, has many ideas to his credit. What institutionally begins to happen during the colonial period is that instead of religious, they do, do build a couple of cathedrals, but the principal things that we can see as the chief buildings of Lucknow today are really the secretariat, you know, a democratic government, which they weren't very democratic themselves, but they laid the seedbed of democracy in India and uh, brought the institutional infrastructure, meaning a, it was called the council house. Now it's called something else. I'm not sure what, but in my time, it was the council house and it was made of stone. Not many buildings in Lucknow are made of stone. The Imam Baras are made of thin brick and mortar. And the mortar is not cement. It is, you know, chuna and urad ki dal and that is lime and lentils and other uh, substances uh, how, uh, to make a stucco, you know, to, to make that which sticks, so sticks the bricks together. And it's very effective because those buildings have seen the test of time and they are standing and now have been recently completely restored by the patronage of the Aga Khan. Uh, the Indian government didn't do anything to help any of those buildings. And you find that the British buildings, which they left behind are the schools, the secretariat, I mean, the whole council house and secretariat complex, uh, palaces designed on the model of palaces in, in Europe, and um, many scientific and uh, bureaucratic offices and laboratories which make up a very important part. I mean, Lucknow is the capital of, of uh, UP. And if UP was a, a independent country, it would be the eighth largest country in the world. So we're not talking of a, a small little avad with a tiny place called Lucknow, but we're talking of a really a very important place in in the ranks. It, when it was in, in uh, Nawabi hands, it was called one of the finest cities in existence in the, on the planet. It isn't there now, that now, because the colonials uh, introduced this brick and mortar architecture and a lot of the housing is, you know, rather uh, aesthetically um, un, unsavory. But the new parts which Mayavati has developed, and uh, I don't know, she didn't build palaces for herself, but she has certainly bought over some of the fine, finer homes and uh, re had them redone for what befits a ruler of a place, even though she's you know not been in power for that long. And we hope that she will return and do the city 
a new favor because uh, I think she controlled law and order very well. I have studied her, her rule as it came out in newspapers and things. And on the whole, it was a very beneficial rule for Lucknow. So we are wishing her the best for the next election. We hope that all the people who have loved her and who will vote for her and or for Akhilesh, or they both should come in jointly really to represent the new face of India, the new and modern face of India. That's what we want. We are tired of uh, being nostalgic about either the Nawabs or you know, even the older rulers of, of uh, India. And we want highly educated modern people who can lead the country to bigger heights and the city to greater glory because Lucknow has now got the hallmarks of the modern city. It has malls, it has high rises. These are creeping in, um, erasing some of the colonial palaces which were built by the Talukdars, uh, rebuilding them in the style of, uh, you know, skyscrapers are copied from New York. So you find miniature skyscrapers, you know, 20 stories, 30 stories max in Lucknow now, and the skyline is changing, has changed. So the, this idea of power reshaping the city is really quite um, demonstrable in the history of Lucknow itself. And those of us who have seen its skyline change three times um, over the course of our staying in that city, we, uh, we can say that power dictates urbanization, the directions in which it can grow, who can live where, and how that city will rank in the hierarchy of cities in the world. So here, I think I've kept you very long. Oh my word, yes, indeed. So I will um, open this up to questions if you wish, or whatever is next planned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Orlenberg. And I think no word can uh, do justice uh, to this very eloquent and very uh, illustrated lecture that you have presented to us. And you have, uh, answered a lot of questions and you have posed a lot of questions mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. A lot of questions to the younger generation who are living in Lucknow, who are living around Lucknow. And you have answered questions that the young people had, you know, about the shaping of the city, how the city has shaped over the ages. Mm -hmm. And you have given it in a comprehensive one hour, 30 minutes approx. So thank you so oh, much, God. Professor Oldenburg, for that. And I found, uh, while, while you were speaking about the Taluk, I found an image, a 1906 image, when uh, I think Prince of Wales or, or yeah, Prince of Wales visited uh, Lucknow and laid the foundation store of uh, King George Medical College, where yes. they had a gathering of all the Talukdars, Jagirdars, and indeed, Rajas. Indeed, it's yes, indeed. And I'll, I'll, I'll just show it to our viewers. Yes, please do. And if you have an image of Constantia, which is a Frenchman building a palace in the Renaissance style in Lucknow, is really quite a piece of exotica, which you know is one of the biggest uh, tourist attractions. And today has been completely restored um, head to foot, thanks to the money that Elton D'Souza saved and uh, McFarland, the new principal, has so very wisely and sagaciously used to restore it to its glory. Yes. I'll show both the pictures and uh, just a moment. I'm just setting up the uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. So this is a, this is a picture very unique uh, in nature where you see all the talukdars and jagirdars of Awadh region and we have the prince in the center. 
So it's it was clicked in 1906, uh, and I think the money was given by all the talukdars for yes. the for the making of the medical college. And the second is Constantia in in Lucknow. It's a beautiful building, actually. Yeah, and, and it faces the Gomti. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So these are the two beautiful images that I found, and I also found that uh, the wife uh, beauties of Lucknow album. Yes, yeah, the beauties of Lucknow album. True, this uh, lecture could have done with fewer words and far more wonderful pictures to bring it to life. <laughs> but I, I, um, you know, I'm now I have retired from my job, so I don't have all the equipment to do that anymore. Otherwise, I would have done it. And I should have had the wit to tell you to do it and sent you all the materials. I, I still Not have the materials. Yeah. But truly, truly, it was an honor listening to you, Professor Oldenburg. And uh, I had a question that I also posed in the beginning that about what you meant by reshaping. And you already answered that in uh, very, very uh, comprehensively in the, in the uh, presentation. I, I'll see if we have any questions from our audience. Uh, yeah. we, I do not see any question as of now, but I request our viewers that they can send their questions to Professor Aldenberg uh, through email. Our email ID is carbonheritage at gmail.com and you can send us your questions in writing. We'll be forwarding those emails to Professor Aldenberg that she can get back to you through email. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining in. And okay. I request Professor Aldersberg to just stay back for five more minutes after the live because we wanted to uh, record some uh, short videos with you after this uh, certainly, live. Certainly, I'm, I'm, I'm at your service. Go ahead. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining in live. We'll be back again with another lecture uh, on 20th and 22nd of November on the YouTube channel of Carvan. If you're new to this channel, do subscribe. Do share it with your friends, family, and do like this video. Drop your feedback in the comments. We will be happy to read them. Thank you so much and have a great evening ahead.